certainly ties to lecture five. Okay, so I'm using uh, the matrix I'm calling K because I have in mind one of our stiffness matrices, one of our A transpose A or A transpose CA, symmetric, positive, definite. So, so this, this, uh, this is a nice matrix. And we know from lecture five, its eigenvalues are real and its eigenvectors are or can be chosen orthonormal. And, and more than that, we know more about A transpose A and A transpose CA, don't we? Uh, those are symmetric and positive definite, or, or at least positive semi-definite. So, so I'm thinking of uh, here as K as being symmetric, let's say positive definite. And, and that tells me that the the symmetry tells me, that, tells me that the x's are orthonormal, as always, and the eigenvalues are real, as always, but now the positive definite part tells me the lambdas are all positive. Okay. So uh, that's, that's a, a, a nice situation to be starting in. No, no problems. So how do we use them? Suppose we found them. Suppose we've, we've got these guys, x's and lambdas. And if, if just a complete uh, thought that came up in discussion. Uh, those were very special matrices in the last lecture. Normally, I couldn't write down a matrix and write down, start, say, what are its eigenvalues, what are its eigenvectors. But for those particular matrices, we could do it. And I felt it was worth doing because special matrices are, are what come up in reality, uh, even if it's not the most general mathematical case, it's what you see in, in practice. Okay, so uh, you could keep those matrices in mind, but how do we solve? Uh, so what I'm going to, to, to give you an advanced shot at the lecture, this, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are going to solve this ordinary first derivative. That's du dt. This means du dt. U dot, I could also put u sub, subscript t. Uh, the derivative of u equal ku. And they will also solve second derivative of u. And then it's more natural to have the ku on this side. Uh, now, if the real, the most fundamental equation in dynamics is Newton's law. Newton's law wins, of course. Okay. So what's Newton's law? Well, Newton's law includes mass times acceleration. So there is a mass here. If all the masses in our spring system were equal, then, of course, that would be just a multiple of the identity, and we could get back to this one. But the physical problem has got a mass matrix as well as a stiffness matrix. And of course, it might have a right-hand side. There might be an external driving force as well as uh, the free oscillations that would come from uh, with no force. OK, so we're talking here about oscillations, oscillations, and hear about more of a diffusion type equation. So this is more like a heat equation. These are like just, just finite dimensional wave equations. And then the other point to see in a, to, to mention in advance is when we have two matrices in the differential equation, then we're going to have two matrices in the eigenvalue problem. And it often gets called the generalized eigenvalue problem. We hope that this matrix M is extremely nice, possibly even diagonal, positive diagonal um, masses there, and uh, gives us not much trouble. But uh, really, it's that problem. OK. So now you see what's coming. Now let's see it come. Uh, how, how do you solve? Let's find some solutions, special solutions to that differential equation. So, 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 solutions, solutions. What's one solution? One solution is 
to follow is to stay with one of the eigenvectors. Of course, we've got n eigenvectors, so I really should put subscripts. As, as we saw in the last lecture, there's there are n of these eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and so this i goes from 1 to n. And similarly there, kxi will be lambda i mxi, n of them. Okay, so focus on one of them, say the first one, x1. Okay, that's a vector, fixed. Now, how can we use that to solve this differential equation? So I'm looking for some solutions, u of t. That vector times e times a, the, the whole point, of course, about pinning down an eigenvector is that for that special vector, our matrix is just acting like a number. So we could pretend we were solving this equation with a number on the right side, like lambda. So what would be the, what would be the solution to our differential equation? The derivative equals lambda times the function. So that's the most basic first order differential equation. Derivative equals lambda times function. Uh, it's exponential. That's where E, you know, the most important function of calculus comes from. The fact that the derivative is the function or a multiple of the function. We just need E to the lambda 1 t. Because, of course, it's the lambda 1 that goes with the x1. That solves as one solution, it, it's, if we substitute it for u, or any multiple of it, so I can multiply it by any number c1, right? Because this equation, homogeneous, if I multiply both sides by c1, I'm still fine. So there is a special, you could say special, ex pure exponential solution. We ought, to, we ought to be able to plug it into that equation and see that it works. Can we plug that into the, plug that into this equation just to see that it works? What's the left hand side? If I take the time derivative of this thing, what do I get? Lambda one times what I've got, right? The time derivative will bring down a lambda one u. I'll write u for the whole deal for the moment. And now on the right hand side, what happens if I multiply by k? k times this. What's k times that? Well, so I'm multiplying a matrix. This is a vector, of course. Everything's a vector here. u is a vector. x is a vector. Well, not everything. Those are scalars. That u is a vector. x is a vector. Now, what happens if I multiply this by k? What happens? Well, these are numbers. They just factor right out. And I have kx1, which is lambda 1x1. Right? So when I multiply by k, all this is not changed. The only thing comes out is a lambda 1. It comes out. It, it works. It works. If I take the time derivative, a lambda 1 comes out. If I multiply by k, a lambda 1 comes out. So it solves the equation. OK, tell me a second solution to the differential equation. Well, the same thing with 2. And the same thing with 3. So the solution could be a combination of these guys all the way up to any multiple of e to the lambda nt times the its eigenvector, xn. So again, these are vectors. u is a vector, x1 is a vector, xn is a vector. And that's the general solution. It's got n constants to play with. It's like it's the null space of u prime minus ku. It's the, if I put u prime minus ku on one side, I found the, the, all, everything in the null space, all the solutions. And what would I use them for? Well, what, how would I use these c1, c2, up to cn? There, I've got n numbers still to play with. Well. They would, they would, I would use those to match initial conditions. So I would, th these equations come with u at zero is given. So at t equals zero, 
all these e to the t's are all ones. So I just have c1 x1 and c2 x2 and cn xn have to agree with u u of zero. Right. So that would so then the so that equation satisfied, and then use the c1 up to cn to match the given initial condition u of zero. Good. I, I don't think I want to, I mean, I haven't done examples. Uh, this, whole top, this whole lecture, that is lecture five and this part, is in section 1.5. Well, maybe that's not there, but this is. So can I put maybe at the top here section 1.5 of the applied math book? And I'll suggest some uh, particular exercises out of that section, uh, which would allow you to execute these steps. Uh, all I'm doing here is saying eigenvalues and eigenvectors give us a great bunch of special solutions. Some very convenient ones. Normal modes, these are called. Yeah, what? Oh, let's tie them to, to, let's connect this. Oh, I haven't got anything oscillating yet until I get to second derivative. So let me, let me move on to second derivatives. So now I'm ready for this guy. Okay, so this was number one. U here. Okay, that, that led to here. Okay, now I'm ready to, to tackle the second equation. What are the special solutions for this now? U of t is something, and, and tell me what? Special solutions, now I want the second derivative, so now I'm going to take second derivatives. Well, you hope I'm going to, it's going to be something times the first eigenvector, right? That was what made everything great, is that we use, we followed the eigenvectors. We're following these normal modes of motion. So x1. But now what can I, and of course I can multiply by a c1, because again, they're multiplying through by c1, no problem. But, but what do I have? I don't have exponentials anymore. I've got sines and cosines. Sines and cosines. So why, well, let's put them in and see why. Let me just take a sine, for example. C1 sine of something t instead of, and we have to think of what's that something, times the first eigenvector. We want that to work. So let's plug it in and make it go. What will happen here? I'm, this is a question mark at the moment. Okay, what, what's going to work there? Well, let's it, plug in this form into the equation, see what we need. The second time derivative will be what? It'll be a minus because there's a second derivative. It'll still be the sign, right? The time derivative is only, this is constant, that's constant. So, so wh what do I want there? Do I want a square root of lambda? Then when I do this term, what will happen when I multiply by k? That'll bring a lambda, right? So the way I've got the signs, I want, I want a, I think I want a square root of minus lambda. Wait a minute. Have I, let's see. Uh, I, the way I've chosen k, uh, and let's settle on that same k, yeah, should I, am I better with, a, uh, with, uh, ha, yes, right, right. So what do I want here? Square root of lambda? Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I made that harder than it should have been. Square root of lambda one, right? Now, did it work? Yes, right, thanks, I'm in your debt. The second derivative will uh, will produce a minus sign, and then k x will produce the lambda. So the so we'll get a lambda one coming out of both uh, a minus lambda one from one term and a lambda one from the other. Perfect. Or cosine. 
So we could have a C1 and maybe a D1 sine cosine. Well, wouldn't that do just as well? Square root of lambda 1 T x1. OK. So w w what's happening here? I'm getting two special solutions for every eigenvector. Over here, I got one special guy. Now I'm getting two special guys. And then plus, so on, plus, there will be a CN sine of square root of lambda n t x n. And also, just as well, could have cosine of square root of lambda n t x n. So each eigenvector is like producing two solutions. And now I've got how many constants have I got? 2n, right? I've got all the c's and all the d's now. So what do I do with 2n constants? I'm matching, instead of just matching the initial, so I'll use the, use the c's and d's to match what? The initial vector u of 0 and, and u prime. So there I've got n u prime, the initial velocity. So here I have a, I've got a line of springs. I've got a line of springs. And what, what am I doing physically with this line of springs here? So here's our like line of springs. There's a spring and a mass, and a spring and a mass, and a spring and a mass, let's say. Suppose I did it with the, uh, that would be the B matrix, right? No, the T, yeah. That would be like the T matrix where the, well, it would be fixed free. Uh, if, if you want me to get to the K matrix, I fixed the last one. But what, what's the physical problem now? That that's that's that, that's that I'm close to here. It's it's I I move the springs away from equilibrium and let go. They oscillate, right? They they oscillate uh, indefinitely. No friction, no damping. A damping term would be probably involve a first derivative, a velocity. But here, that's this is a totally conservative system. And uh, the, the springs will just oscillate forever. And with what frequencies? With these frequencies, the square roots of the eigenvalues. And it's, we're happy to know that those eigenvalues are positive, so we can take their square roots. Right. Is that? So there is a mechanical engineering, absolutely prototype problem of uh, springs with identical masses, with identical masses so that there's, so we don't have to worry about a mass matrix. Now, are you ready to worry about the mass matrix? This is our third example. Suppose these masses are now different. Of course, we had our spring constants. They go into the K. Right? Do you remember the K is our A transpose CA, no change. But now we have a mass matrix, which would be M1, M2, M3. Diagonal in this case. Where is that coming from? Newton's law. Newton's law is, I mean, that's what's governing the motion of these springs, the mass times the acceleration equal the force. OK, and what's the force? The force is partly an external force, F, but partly an internal force coming from where? So what are the forces on those, on those masses that are making them move? The springs, the springs. So these are in, this is internal force from the springs. This is external force from uh, whatever we, we might do. It could be zero. If it is zero, then it's just 
purely a closed system and the energy would be conserved and we could it would come out of the differential equation that the energy was conserved the total energy in the springs plus the energy in the masses so let's just I'll just note that down if this was zero then the this is conservative know if it's compassionate or not but it's conservative uh, so the kinetic energy that's in the masses plus the potential energy strain energy in the springs would be constant constant energy okay I, I we could uh, the notes will uh, derive that fact from the differential equation. I, I just think maybe it's, uh, I know you guys are not doing mechanical engineering, uh, or at least uh, some maybe, but not about a lot, uh, looking at other parts of mathematics, but, and, and, and not masses and springs, but this is really the fundamental equation of motion. Newton's law, ma equal force. And how would we solve it? I'm, let's solve it. I, I, when I say solve it, I, I really mean how could we write down a formula for the answer? I mean, to solve something it really has two meanings here in, in this course. We either solve it by a formula or we solve it by an algorithm. And we really ought to know something about both. Um, the formula, of course, is going to be like limited to cases where we have uh, everything beautiful, where uh, the algorithm has to be prepared for whatever the, the, the real problem is. So in these early lectures in the course, we're talking mostly about formulas. You know, occasionally I'll say, wait a minute, here's a comment on an algorithm, like computing eigenvalues. I said you don't use the determinant of A minus lambda I unless the matrix is like two by two or something. Or, or unless the professor has cooked up a three by three, but not, not in reality. And similarly here, uh, well, only in, only in the most beautiful cases would I expect to uh, get everything from these, from these simple formulas. Now, just to complete, how does this problem, why does this problem connect to this equation? Well, of course, I just want, so what are my special solutions to this one? I think they'll look just the same. They'll be identical. It's just that when I plug them into this equation, I better the lambdas better come out of that eigenvalue problem. Do, do you see what what happens? So let's let's plug one in. Let's see if I plug that into this equation. So what happens? Let's see. When I plug this in, multiply by k, and I get kx1. And by my special eigenvectors, that's the same as lambda 1 mx1. And when I plug it into that term, I get the lambda and the minus and the m. So do you see it works? You see that, you see that it's the same idea. I don't even have to write a new solution. So it's the same form. But the x1 and the lambda 1 have to come from this generalized eigenvalue problem if we're going to be okay with that M in the equation. Okay, yeah, good question. Now, what if I, uh, can I, can I get back to my, so the question was, shall I just multiply by M inverse? That would, wouldn't be a bad idea. Let me, let me just make a few comments on this problem. Okay, how, so that was the M, and it probably had a very simple form. So, uh, so what comments on this kx equal, how would you tackle kx equal lambda mx? 
Well, as you say, one way, well, the sort of first idea would be if m is simple, multiply by m inverse, and we've got back to a standard problem. Now, why should I quibble with that? It might be, but probably, it, so it might be hard to find m inverse, but in a lot of cases it's diagonal or nearly, because it's coming from these masses and not, you know, it's a separate mass matrix. It's just like Newton's law. So what's, what's my little objection to this problem? It's not symmetric. That's my little objection. It's, it's so like, you know, it's a good friend of a symmetric problem. I mean, where this one was, had symmetric matrices in it, m inverse times k, if I multiply, right? If I, you, you see that? If I had my, so it might be my two minus ones matrix. And then if I multiply by m inverse, so one over m1, one over m2, one over m3, now I've screwed up the symmetry, right? The, 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 this will put a, minus, a one, over m, one over m1 here, and on the other side of the diagonal will come the one over m2. Uh, can you suggest how I could fix it? I would like my problem to be symmetric. Why would I like it to be symmetric? Well, first, MATLAB has a special algorithm for symmetric eigenvalue problems. And the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Like, you know, everything nice that I know came from that symmetric case. But I could, I could get this to be symmetric just with a little effort. Uh, how to do it? Let's see. I could somehow I want to put half of m on each side of k. So what really I would really be happier. I, I could like change variables. I could let like I could let square root of m. Can I write square root of m or m to the one half? It's just going to be the square root of each term. So let me call it m to the one half m to the one half, let, let x be, let m introduce a new variable. In place of x, you see, I'm just, I'm just normalizing or, or rescaling x, the components of x. So in place of x, I put m to the one half y. So this is, this is k m to the one, ooh, do I want it? Maybe I want m to the minus one half y, right? Because I wanted a minus a half to appear here. So, so my x, I'm now cooking up a y. y is m to the one half x, or x is m to the minus one half y. So for that x, I'll put in m to the minus one half y. And this is lambda m, m to the minus one half y. Was that all right? I'm making this look more complicated. I'm just, I'm just rescaling the x. It's like noise whitening. It's like, it's like we just, uh, we always have a choice. Do we deal with a slightly lopsided problem, or in the in the estimation of the of last week, uh, we needed a weighting matrix. So it's like M is our weighting matrix. Well, if we jiggle around slightly and use a different unknown, we can get back to the, the best case. And do you see that we, are we, does that look better or worse? Do you see that that is actually better? What's better about that? Everybody, everybody sees that I just took my problem here. I didn't want to go this way. I didn't really want to do it, but I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to get it. Now, now what have I got here? That's m times m to the minus one half. So what is that? That's, that's m to the one half. And then when I bring it on the other side, I finally got what I want. K m to the one m to the minus a half y equals lambda y. You can look at that on the video. Those steps are just straightforward. 
And the result was that we have this nice matrix, which is symmetric and will still be positive definite. So it's sort of our, our Ys, then, are these nice orthonormal guys. All we did, and I just mention it because this generalized eigenvalue problem really does come up in a lot of, and not only in mechanics. But that was, you see that point? That, that All I've done is, by adjusting the problem, get half of M inverse on one side and the, and the same thing on the other side and kept the symmetry. OK. OK. But either way, I get these lambdas, and I just, I've got the solution. I, I, I'm, I'm the, this is exactly half half hour into lecture six, and that's really what I wanted to do with differential equations. Because uh, I wanted you to see what are these eigenvalues and eigenvectors good for. And they really pay off in initial value, dynamic problems, because we can follow one normal fixed mode, and it has a simple evolution. Of course, if the problem's nonlinear, or even if the coefficients are variable, changing with time, that's shot. So this, this pure stuff is, these pure exponentials are really coming from the first order equation, u prime equal lambda u. I mean, that's the, that's the prototype equation, u prime equal lambda u. And uh, our system reduces to n of these because each we follow each eigenvector separately. OK, you, you see that idea. Could I uh, now, what I had in mind for this, um, to take half an hour more on the general, on, on, on other topics in uh, linear algebra. OK, and here on this board I wrote the the two big the two big guys that we've got for the for the symmetric case especially symmetric positive definite case are what did what does ldl transpose come from can can you have a look at that board just as i make some space here on this one so now we're at the top half of that board And I guess what I'm trying to say there, so this is now, uh, this is now linear algebra. Factorizations in linear algebra. Or factorizations, every factorization representing some important algorithm in linear algebra. Okay. So I start with these two guys that we've seen. K equal L, D, L transpose. That's a factorization in the lower triangular, diagonal, upper triangular. And what was the algorithm that this factorization came from? Elimination. So that's from elimination on a, on a symmetric positive definite matrix. Okay, and the second one we just got is Q lambda Q transpose. And what algorithm or what problem led us to that factorization of what was this factorization? This was an orthogonal matrix times a diagonal times a transpose of, of the orthogonal, so another orthogonal matrix. What led us to that? The eigenvalue problem. So this was this is this is what we've got. The two E's, elimination and eigenvalue. Of course, in reality, this one numerically is much harder than this one. This one's just mechanical. Dot 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 dot, and you've got it. In some fixed number of steps, you got it exactly. This one you can't get exactly in a fixed number of steps because you can't find the roots of a polynomial in a fixed number of steps. 
Galois died in, uh, after, uh, after he proved that. And, uh, well, not, that wasn't cause and effect. He was, <laughs> he was killed in a duel, and we regret it very much. Uh, yeah, he was the best graduate student I know of, and uh, never finished. Okay. So, now there are two more factorizations of fundamental importance in linear algebra. These are about square matrices. So, just to emphasize that. These are about square and actually positive definite. Square and actually positive definite matrices. Okay. Now, I want to consider general rectangular, any rectangular matrix. And that I'll call A. So I have two factorizations to tell you about. Corresponding, so you're, you're getting linear algebra in a nutshell here. The, the, the sort of heart of linear algebra is in these four. And this one is a, let's see. Well, everybody is. Everybody describes it as QR, A equal QR. So I have to tell you what the Q is and the R. So this is orthogonal matrix times R, sort of for right upper times upper triangular. It's a different Q. I'm tempted to write O, but then you won't think it's zero, right? I, 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 I would like it not to get confused with that Q, and everybody write, calls it Q, but can I call it O for the moment? So this is the orthogonal, it's an orthogonal matrix times this matrix up to the right. And uh, this is a, Fundamental step. This, this means you, 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 uh, your orthogonal. So it's associated with this famous two guys, Graham Schmidt. Two guys with one idea. Okay, and this this expresses their idea that if I have a bunch of vectors, say the columns of A. So can I start with the columns of A? So suppose it just has two columns. There's Here's the matrix A, here's column one, here's column two. So what's, we want to get to this matrix O, or Q. And what, tell me about its columns. What's the deal with the columns of, of the orthogonal matrix? They're, they're at a right angle. They're unit vectors. So now we would like to have unit vectors. Maybe this first direction is fine, but the second direction should be like that, right? So this would be the Q1 and Q2 vectors, the columns of O. What's the Gram-Schmidt idea? If I gave you those two columns, or if I gave them to Gram and Schmidt and let them have a contest, uh, what would they do? How would they produce Q1? From the, from the given A. Normalize it to a unit vector. That's all there'd be to do. How would they produce Q2? They would, yep, they'd, they, column two is not at a right angle. So they'd project somehow, I mean, geometrically, they would figure out the They'd figure out this projection, but it's really that part they want. It's the E part, the error part, that they would identify. And then what final step would be? Normalize to length one. Okay, so what matrix is going to go into this process? What matrix does Graham, do Graham and Schmidt have to ultimately use? Uh, they, they're projecting. 
And, and what was the matrix? What was the equation that we got to in, deal, in doing projections? This isn't weighted now. It's just regular projections. It was A transpose A. Somewhere in, in this process comes A transpose A, which is our K. So what I want to do is show how this K will be, this will be our A transpose A. What I'm trying to do is say that these two come from these two. These two, well, I'll, I haven't quite said what this guy is. It's going to be the singular value decomposition. Let me fill, that, fill this in. This is the other great and more and more famous uh, factorization into orthogonal, diagonal, orthogonal. You might say the number of ideas here, the number of rearrangements, is pretty small because we're always working with triangular matrices, orthogonal matrices, diagonal matrices. We're just playing all the possible combinations. But this is a highly important one, and it's called, so it's orthogonal, orthogonal times diagonal times orthogonal. And it's known as the singular value decomposition, the SVD. So that's a, a terrific um, um, terrifically useful uh, factorization. It's a nice thing to know. Now, of course, Sometimes those fact you could say, wait a minute, we've seen orthogonal times diagonal times orthogonal before. Where did we see it before? We saw it up here. That's orthogonal times diagonal times orthogonal. But what's the difference then between here and here? One, well, that's right. This is for square matrices. But anyway, this could, this would, uh, rectangular or uh, this, this matrix could be square. If it was square, how would they, there still would be a difference between the two. Different, yeah, different, or this was the same orthogonal matrix, and that was because why? Because the matrix was symmetric, right. Because the matrix was symmetric. Here we're taking some other matrix, not symmetric anymore, let's just say, Two, one, one. Oh, don't make it symmetric. I can't help myself. Uh, zero, one. Okay, there is a matrix, not symmetric. That's my A, and it, but it can be factored into orthogonal times diagonal times orthogonal. But these um, two orthogonal matrices will be different. They couldn't be the same, or I would have a I would have an automatically symmetric matrix. And what are the numbers that go on in this diagonal matrix? Up here, the numbers that went in here were the eigenvalues. In here, the numbers that go in here are called the singular values. So that's why it's called the singular value decomposition. Okay. And my point is that this factorization for a square A, for a, for, a, for a rectangular A, the SVD, comes from this factorization for A transpose A. Should I, should I write that down? Because I'm afraid that that's not in the book. It'll be in the next book, but it's not in this one. So, so the, the point about this was um, that LDL transpose for A transpose A connected to QR or OR, whatever we're calling it, for A. And then the point about the second guy is that, that Q lambda Q transpose for A transpose A, that'll be our K, connects to U sigma V transpose for our A. That's, uh, I, I'm, I'm 
proved a thing here, but I'm trying to say that we really have got in our grasp not only the first two, which we've done in detail, but we can use those to capture the second two, and then we've got the whole thing just by applying the first two to k equal a transpose of, which is our symmetric positive definite matrix. Okay. So how do I make that connection between the the, the a transpose a factorization and the a alone factorizations? Okay, I've got two to do. I've got to connect this one to this one, this one to this one, and I've got to connect this one to this one. Right? That's the that's the job. And and uh, important facts come out from that. This Graham Schmidt will be finite steps. In a finite number of steps, we orthogonalize those vectors into this one, into these vectors. So, so Graham Schmidt is just a se sequence of steps. We could, you know, we could write out a, a code to do it. This one and this one can't be done in a finite number of steps. That's, that's what Galois said. Uh, so we can't find the singular value decomposition exactly in a, in a fixed set of steps, but of course, numerical linear algebra is highly occupied with doing this fast. A fast algorithm that gets, it, gets, gets uh, um, all the accuracy you want. So we're fast methods for, and, and people have come up with new ideas. And, and you know, that's a crucial, um, um, crucial step in, in this subject is to find new ways, maybe for certain classes of matrices. Okay, so now let me try to make this connection. Suppose I, suppose I'm looking for that. Okay, uh, let me suppose I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get hold of that. Then what will A transpose A be? Can, can you just take that, this thing that I'm hoping for, and say, what would A transpose A be? Just, if I have that, what, what, would the, what would that lead me to A transpose A, and then I'll match with this? Can, can you just take A, tra what's A transpose? V, V, sigma transpose, U transpose, right? And now I'll put in A, which is U sigma V transpose. Okay, now I got six things on the right. But what's the what's the good point here? U transpose U is I. U transpose U, that was the point of orthogonal matrices. U transpose U was I. So this is the identity. So I don't even write it in. Let me just close that gap. Okay. Now compare that with the with the regular, what, what's, what's up? I can identify what's the V that I'm looking for here in the singular value decomposition. It's the Q. V is the Q. V is the Q. V for A is the Q for A transpose A. And what about the lambda? and the sigma. Well, lambda's got a match, right? The V's match the Q, and the Q transpose matches the V transpose. That's got to be match the lambda. So these singular values on the diagonal squared are the eigenvalues of A transpose A. These are the singular values of A. These come from singular values of A, and these guys come from A transpose A. And of course, we don't surprise to see a square because we sort of squared A. 
We did literally square A. We took A transpose A, which was the right way to square it. Okay, how about, let's see, I guess we still have a U. Would you want to, so, so what did we discover then? Describe V now. What, what did we learn here? That the V in this is what, what matrix is it? It's the Q. What was the Q? It was the eigenvectors of A transpose A. Right. The V here should be the eigenvectors of A transpose A. Now, would you want to make a shot at the U? At the other piece? How could we get V out of the picture and U in the picture? A, A transpose. That's the bright idea. Exactly. If I take A, A transpose, which is another K, a different K, by the way. Now let's write A, A transpose, U, sigma, V transpose, and now I'm ready for the transpose, V, sigma, transpose, U transpose. Now, sorry, that looks a little raced, but what's good there? It's just like the one above, but sort of everything in the opposite order. So what's up? V transpose V in the middle is the identity. So again, I can just erase it. So I've learned what U is. U is the, yeah, V is the Q. This, this came for A transpose A. And what is U? You see it? See what I'm, what I'm barely got room to put? What's the U for? This U is, I'm seeing it here, it's the U, this is my, this is my lambda, this is my U transpose, so match it with, it's, it's not coming from A transpose A, it's coming from A A transpose, right. It's the U is coming, is the eigenvector matrix of A A transpose where what I really should have said here is V is the eigenvector, eigenvector matrix for A transpose A. And the point is, in a rectangular typical case, those are different. Let me just make sure we know that. Here was a typical A. Let's take A transpose A. A transpose A is to what? Please, transpose that matrix. So what do I get for A transpose A? I get 4, 2, 2, 2. Is that right? What's remarkable about that matrix? So here's my A. Here's my A transpose. What's, what can you tell me about that matrix? For symmetric for sure and positive definite. But is it the same as A A transpose? I doubt it. Let's put them in the opposite order. 2, 0, 1, 1 coming on this side of 2, 0, 1, 1. Do the multiplication. And what do I get? I hope it's not the same. 5, good. 5, 1, 1, and 1. Okay, different matrix. That's the AA transpose matrix. So that so it will have different eigenvectors, but same eigenvalues. Actually, notice that we that had to happen here because one case we had anyway, you know, one case we had eigenvalues of this, and one other case we had eigenvalues of that. And the beauty is that they're the same, the eigenvalues. Do, do you, any idea why the eigenvalues of those two matrices, if I, if I reverse the order of multiplication, I get a different matrix, but the eigenvalues don't change. So that's just good luck. A and A, A transpose A and A A transpose have the same eigenvalue. So those eigenvalues are the singular values squared. Uh, how would you convince me that those matrices had the same eigenvalues without actually computing them? You'd, somebody would take the, the sum, the trace would be a good, if that doesn't work, 
we're, we're, we won't make it. What's the trace of the two matrices? Both six. So the eigenvalues add up to the same thing. Now I need one more fact, of course, to really be sure that they're the same. Uh, it would be nice like if I knew the product of the eigenvalues. And that's the determinant. So the sum of the eigenvalues, let me write that, let me write those wonderful facts. We, we wrote before that the sum of the eigenvalues was the trace. The sum down the, equals the sum down the diagonal. And the product of the eigenvalues is the determinant. Those are the two decent facts about. So, and I hope that those matrices have the same determinant. In fact, yeah, what's the determinant here? Four, five minus one, eight minus four. So in both cases, the determinant is four, and the trace is six, and the eigenvalues are whatever the two magic numbers are, then multiply to give six, and multiply to give four, and add to give six. That, that's, uh, there'd be some square roots in there, but whatever, they're the same. Okay. So that, well, I have, I've just uh, sort of claimed that the SVD was worth your attention. And I wanted to show that it came from the one we know. Now, I guess I, if time allows, I ought to, to be systematic here. I should also show how this one connects to this one. Is that right? I, I, you're getting a lot of letters in this, uh, and not many numbers. This, this was like a breather here to, to uh, do numbers. Uh, but actually, yeah, maybe I could use that same example here. Yeah, let me, let me, let, let's get some, some numbers, all right? I, I have to tell you that, uh, I, so I taught linear algebra this fall at MIT, created a final exam got all typed up, you know, 280 copies Xerox, and then went to sleep. And I woke up early thinking, I made that exam too hard. Uh, this, is, this is like horrible, uh, because you spend a whole semester with a class, your, your friend, you hope, and, uh, and they're all coming to that exam at the end of December with their bag, right, you know, their suitcase <laughs> next to them. They're going to the flight. And if you uh, have made the exam too hard, they're just uh, not happy. Their whole Christmas is spoiled. Uh, so, um, uh, so I changed it a little to make it OK. Uh, but still, it was a bit on the hard side. And it was mostly letters, where I love to give examples. I just messed up. I just thought of too many problems. In fact, the first problem was the one that I'm going to tell you about, if time allows, the connection of that to that. Anyway, too many letters. And, and, and as they passed in the papers, one, of the, one guy in the class, a good-humored guy, said, what have you got against numbers? And I thought, wait a minute, to say that to a mathematician is really cruel. But uh, uh, he was totally right that the, that the exam had been uh, letters. So, and this was one of the questions. So let me do it first with numbers. Here's our matrix A. What's, what are the, or now I'm, everybody spotting on the board what I'm doing? I'm now doing the the orthogonal times upper triangular. Could you factor that one into an orthogonal times an upper triangular? I, I, so it's like, it's like the first, this first column is the two zero vector. And the second column is the one one vector. Yeah, look, our pictures fits the problem. What's the, what are the, what's the, what are, what are the orthogonal guys that Graham Schmidt would struggle to find? Tell me what the orthogonal matrix uh, is that comes from that. Okay, what's the, what's the guy in this direction? One zero, right, because we want a unit vector. So we just scale it. What's the other one? Zero one, because it's the projection, it's the guy in this direction, and then stretched out to a unit vector. So zero one. 
So what's our matrix Q in this case? So I've got to get the whole thing here. Here's our matrix, and I'm factoring it into into uh, what's the orthogonal matrix and what's the upper triangular. So that was this was the one zero. Okay. Well, everybody knows what that orthogonal matrix has turned out to be. Oh God, this is falling apart, isn't it? Uh, what's the what? I'm upper triangular to start with. Oh, geez. Take that off the tape. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's upper triangular. Of course, this is the, that's the orthogonal matrix. And then here's my happy little matrix again. OK. Well, that was a brilliant factorization. Uh, OK. That goes down in history, unfortunately. All right. Now, what's the connection with, uh, with um, so the idea is that that should somehow connect with the LDL transpose for A transpose A. Holy Moses. Uh, yes, I have a square matrix, right? I have a square matrix that's not anything nice. Hasn't got any square. It's square, but uh, it's not. It, it, it happened to be upper triangular. Yeah, that, that's, I should have made it maybe like 0, 2. Then, then at least it would have been a little, little something to do. Would you like to close with that? Uh, see, I've got 30 seconds. Uh, I could, let, me, let me tell you on the, on the notes for the lecture, rather than just like, you're going to only take in so much in these two hours. I think you guys are terrific. Uh, um, so let me put in the notes that this, that this triangular factor is associated with this guy. In fact, I need a, I'll take a square root of d over. So the r here, that's the connection, is the r here is the square root of d. So I, 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 need, I just need to split this apart into d to the 1 half, d to the 1 half, d to the 1 half here. I need to just, just taking square roots of those pivots. And I wanted them to be positive, of course, to take the square roots. That's why I'm happy to have this positive. So there's my R. There's my R. That's the connection there. And then, and then this guy is whatever it has to be. I started with an A. The R is this. And then whatever is left is that. And it turns out to be orthogonal. I'll put that in the notes. Let, 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 stay with me. One more moment, just so I don't go down with such a contemptible example, uh, and I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just, all I'll do is uh, do the same example with uh, with a matrix that's not quite um, upper triangular already. I'll make it this one. Okay. So my two vectors are, uh, yeah, tell me now my two orthogonal vectors and my upper triangular guy. OK, do Graham Schmidt. So the first vector is 0, 2, and I want it to normalize it to be 0, 1. And then the other guy, you can pretty well guess. It'll be orthonormal, so it'll be 1, 0. And now, what's this matrix come out to be? Let's see. This is just going to exchange the rows, right? So I better exchange those rows to, uh, yeah. So uh, that example is marginally better. Uh, at least I didn't have the identity matrix, and I did have to exchange rows. But of course, if I change that 0 to a 6, I'll have all sorts of square roots and so on, because Graham Schmidt always produces square roots. Because as soon as you normalize to length one, you have to divide by a length, a square root, and and uh, it doesn't look so beautiful. So this was a beautiful, but almost as uh, special a case as the first one. Okay, uh, we will have separate 
discussion of the uses of QR, Graham Schmidt, and the uses of SVD, this guy. So uh, this isn't our last look by any means at these, uh, at these four central factorizations of linear algebra. Okay, so I'll put more into the notes, including the connection there that didn't make it into the presentation. But uh, um, so that, uh, and I'll suggest some uh, exercises too in the notes. Okay, see you next Thursday then. Good. <laughs>